we are turning our attention back to ECGs, 12 lead ECG, and uh, the setup of the vectors. Knowing how the vectors are set up will allow us to understand, okay, what kind of information are we looking for, or, or what part of the heart are we looking at. We're not interpreting the information yet, but this will allow us to say, with this foundation, with the setup of the, the ECG under our belt, I can understand how and why we're looking at the full complement, the full um, area within the heart. So the 12 lead ECG gives you much more information than a basic lead two ECG. We're going over the limb leads and chest leads, how they're set up, and you'll do this in lab next week. So we have instead of one vector, one line between two electrodes, we have 12 vectors in a 12 lead ECG. That, uh, that is 12 slices through the heart in different orientations that gives us lots of information. The way the machine is set up, it uses only 10 physical electrodes, and I'll tell you how we're able to accomplish making 12 vectors with only 10 electrodes. Six of them are in the frontal plane, so if you were to cut um, my body from the head down, shoulder to shoulder, and then my front uh, half fell forward, you'd be looking at me in the frontal plane. And then six in the horizontal plane, so from the sternum around the side of the heart horizontally. Six vectors in the frontal plane. The, uh, the diagram on the left is what I described, and then six in the horizontal plane. So we get a really nice picture in three dimensions of the electrical activity in the heart. And we can use the information about the electrical activity to understand the form or the function of the heart. So importantly, we're not looking at the tissue, we're not looking at the musculature, we're looking at the electrical signals. And we're using that information to infer something about function. Just like a normal ECG. How do we set up these six limb leads? Let's start with the leads in the frontal plane because this is what we have experience with. We know what to expect with this first singular lead because we set it up last class. It's part of Einhoven's triangle. The lead two ECG that you're used to is a vector or a straight line drawn between a right arm lead and a left leg lead with the right arm being negative, left leg being positive. Positive wave towards a positive electrode gives you an upwards deflection and vice versa. We talked about this in detail on Tuesday and this was the example that we used for understanding how the wave of depolarization flows. Monitoring electrical activity along this line gives you the characteristic P wave QRS complex, and then the P wave. So this is one of the leads, one of the vectors that we uh, incorporate into the 12 lead ECG. But why stop there? Einhoven's triangle has these two leads in place. I should also mention, you'll set them up likely on the um, right shoulder near the clavicle, the left hip bone, but you could also set these up on the right arm. There are wrist clamps or on the left leg, ankle clamps, that will conduct the signal as well. It gives you the same effective signal. This is just shown on the torso rather than the arms and legs. So we have this lead in place. So far, our understanding is that this left arm lead is ground, and it is used to correct the signal for the lead to ECG. And that's true. But we can also use this to create its own signal. And if this is also a positive electrode, we have a similar setup to our lead two, but now horizontally between the shoulders. So we can draw another vector there from negative to positive. Positive wave towards a positive electrode gives an upwards deflection. And this is called the lead one ECG. This has always been called lead one as part of Einhoven's triangle. It's just not gained popularity because it doesn't give us um, that, that classical information that we're looking for or used to from the lead two ECG. But we can read between these two arm electrodes 
get information horizontally through the heart and understand how the electricity is flowing, the electric signal is flowing in that plane. That's a lead one ECG. Now there's an open end to this triangle. It would be really nice to be able to also measure electrical activity uh, between the left arm and left leg electrodes. But as it stands on the slide, there's a problem. There's no directionality. They're both positive electrodes. Positive wave towards a positive electrode gives you an upwards deflection, but this is just all upwards deflection, no matter which way the signal is heading. So that won't do. It doesn't give us any information. So we use a special type of electrode on the, uh, the left arm. That's called bipolar. Bipolar meaning that it has both a positive and a negative pole. It can activate either of those poles. It can be either positive or negative, depending on which um, electrode it's paired with. And this is a calculation the computer, the sensor does automatically for you. You don't have to worry about flipping a switch. But this electrode is special in that it has both of these poles, whereas the other two are unipolar. They're only negative in the case of the right arm, positive in the case of the left leg. So the bipolar left arm electrode allows us to monitor uh, electrical activity across lead one, and then also between the left two electrodes in what we call lead three. A negative um, and positive electrode create the, the vector on the left-hand side. Lead three is almost vertical. Uh, the left arm uses a bipolar electrode to accomplish this. So we have a pretty nice full-ish picture of the heart in the frontal plane. We can take these vectors. Let's independently add them up on the right-hand side, and we're effectively looking through the heart in these three planes. We get nice information, hopefully, along the main axis of the heart with lead two, and then we get some oblique information with lead one and lead three. And there's a few degrees creative license in copying and pasting those, but we get uh, a relatively comprehensive picture in the frontal plane. We're measuring activity in both directions along each of these blue lines. But we can do better. This, is, this was the gold standard method for evaluating cardiac um, electrical activity and cardiac function for a long time until we got better with echocardiograms and other non-invasive technologies. We want to do better. We want to see more information. And it so happens there's a way that we can use these existing electrodes to create artificial or composite vectors, theoretical, mathematical vectors. So with these electrodes placed on the body, we know that we have information along any line connecting two of the vectors. But we want more resolution. What if we could draw a theoretical vector that splits the difference? And this isn't so unintuitive. Now that the computer will run the simulation for you, it's, it's pretty easy for it to have software built in that will create a vector that takes information from lead 2 below and lead 3 to the left. If it merges that information together, it can expect what's going to happen between those two, at the midway point between those two. It's the sum of lead two and lead three. And we can do this for the left leg vector. We call this an augmented voltage lead. It's AVF for short. AV for augmented voltage. F because it comes from the foot. That's how I remember the, uh, the orientation of these augmented voltage leads. It comes from the foot, or the, the most distal, the most inferior electrode, and it's a mathematical composite of lead two and lead three information put together. So rather than having 
uh, what would it be? Um, 30 degrees separating lead two and lead three. By looking down the middle, we break that up into two smaller 15 degree slices. So we get a much finer composite picture of what's going on in the heart. And we don't only do this with the left leg lead. We can do that with any of the leads in Eindhoven's triangle. So we have AVF, which is a composite of lead two and lead three, making an imaginary vector between the two. We can also use the right arm electrode as the base, create a composite between lead two and lead one. Again, the mathematical sum of those two vectors will create an artificial mathematical augmented voltage vector called AVR coming from the right arm. AVF from the foot, AVR from the right arm. It splits the difference of the other two electrodes, and you can imagine what the last one is then. AVF from the foot, AVR from the right arm, AVL from the left arm. AVL is the uh, combination of lead one and lead three information. So technically, there's only one electrode along this vector, but it uses the information from all of the electrodes in some combination, in some way, shape, or form. So now we have these other three leads, these other three lines that we can uh, use to understand how the uh, signal is moving through the heart. We combine those together. We have a very similar cross-section to what we saw in the last slide. AVF from the foot, AVR from the right arm, AVL from the left arm, hopefully all intersecting and giving us uh, three additional vectors of information. The complete picture through the frontal plane comes from combining both of these. We have our physical vectors. We have our imaginary augmented voltage leads. We put those together and we get this really complicated, high resolution view of the electrical activity through the heart. Many different fine angles in which we can view how the signal's moving through the various parts of the heart. All of these created from three electrodes, but since the left arm is now not ground, it's not correcting the information, it's a bipolar electrode, we had a fourth ground electrode for the right hand leg or the right hip bone, which is outside of, the, uh, of this plane, which is apart from the vectors through the heart that we use to correct that signal and remove any background noise from wiggling around or hitting the wires while you're lying on the table. Um, any, any other interference from radio signals in the, uh, in the picked up by the wires or who knows what. So really complicated view. All of this created by only four physical electrodes. We have a total of six planes, 12 directions because you can go either way on each, uh, on each plane six vectors through the heart in the frontal plane. Complicated information from a very basic setup. What is a bit more complicated that we haven't experienced before, or you probably haven't explored before, are the leads placed in the horizontal plane. This is not typical of a lead to ECG. And the information we get is not typical of what you would see on Gray's Anatomy or ER. This is not looking along the axis of the heart or through the heart in the frontal plane. It's looking through the heart, through the person horizontally, from the front or the side, through the chest. These chest leads are given the prefix V and they're numbered one through six. There are six chest electrodes. Each electrode gives one vector. And these are slightly different 
than the, uh, the vectors that we looked at in the frontal plane. Think about it. The other two, or sorry, the other vectors used two electrodes and drew a line between them. These vectors only use one electrode, and it measures information coming or going. So these are essentially only positive leads. If a signal goes towards it, you get an upwards deflection. If the signal goes away, you get an, uh, a downwards deflection. It can only measure perpendicular to how these are placed on the body. So you can already start to see how that might give us information about the heart. Now, when you go to lab, applying these is not arbitrary. It's pretty easy to fix the other ones, right clavicle or right arm, left clavicle or left arm, left leg, left hip bone. These are a bit more, um, a bit more particular. And the order in which you apply them, I've listed out on the right. So V1, the very first chest electrode, is at the fourth intercostal space, just to the right of the sternum. So you will palpate in lab. There's space one, two, three, three, four. Just to the right of the sternum, I would put one electrode here. V2, same procedure left-hand border. So I could just jump across or I could count down one, two, three, four. Fourth intercostal space just to the right and left of the sternum. Now placing some of these electrodes is a sensitive topic so put your own electrodes on unless you're really comfortable with having your friends palpate and feel around and, and apply the electrodes for you. But it's generally a personal thing that you want to take care of, and there's privacy uh, screens, or there's a bathroom in the lab that you can do it if you want to, as well. Okay. So fourth intercostal space, right and left of the sternum. Next, we skip one. We don't go to three. We jump to four. Four is something we can landmark. That is, from anatomy, you know the mid-clavicular line is halfway through the clavicle. So I can find that point on my body. You can also find the fifth intercostal space. Conveniently, that happens to line up just about under the nipple, if you want to use that as a surface marker as well. But counting down, you can either take the fourth intercostal space, move down to the fifth, and then following that space over, line it up with the mid-clavicular line. Or count down one, two, three, four, five, if you're able. We have landmarks that we can use to place that uh, electrode. We don't have landmarks that are easy to place V3. And so we're going to come back to that. The last one that's easy to place is the sixth one. We skip V5. V6 is the mid-axillary line. So the midpoint of the side of the body beneath the axilla. Right down the, uh, the midline on the side of the body. Again, at the fifth intercostal space. So fourth and fifth intercostal spaces are used a lot. You follow the fifth intercostal space over. It curves up a little bit. And then you put it right in line with your armpit on the mid-axillary line. So I've got, if you're keeping track, I've got V1, V2, V4, and V6. The last two that are harder to place, go in the middle of the electrodes that you have landmarked. V3 goes halfway between V2 and V4. V5 goes halfway between V4 and V6. These aren't going to fall exactly on an intercostal space. They might be over one of your ribs. They might not be at the mid-clavicular line. They might be a third of the way. Um, medial from the, uh, from the end point of the clavicle. There's not an easy way to describe them other than having the existing electrodes in place to say, place them here. So V2 and V3, I would place, or sorry, V2 and V4, I'd place V3 just in the middle, somewhere in the middle, as close to the midpoint as you can. So place them in order. I suppose you could do V6, V4, V2, V1 if you wanted to. 
but v3 and v5 have to go at the end. Now, assuming those are all affixed, the adhesive is secure, they're not falling off, you've got six different electrodes that will give you information through the chest, through the heart of the person. From the front of the sternum, the anterior portion, all the way to the lateral side, you get a fan of information in the horizontal plane through the heart. And it looks, if, this isn't the best way to see how it looks, but you can imagine showing three dimensions on a two-dimensional slide isn't the, uh, the easiest way to go about understanding uh, all of these leads. And it gets kind of messy because there's a lot of lines going through here. But all of the light blue lines are in line with the overhead, in line with the slide. We understand where they all come from. We have our physical lead one, lead two, lead three. The calculations that split the difference between those physical electrodes, the augmented voltage leads. And we just finished placing uh, the chest leads, V1 through V6. And you can kind of get a sense of the, uh, the 3D nature with this squashed uh, oval, this ellipse. You can see some of these chest electrodes focus on different chambers or different areas of the heart. So we would expect V1 and V2 to focus on the right heart, the right ventricle through the back of the heart. V3 and V4 typically line up with the septum. They're in the middle of the heart between the ventricles. And V5 and V6 over on the lateral border, mid-axillary line around that area, We'll look at the left chamber of the heart. So we can divide the functional areas of the heart using these electrodes and combining it with other information that we get from the other vectors as well. I think it probably seems more complicated than it is. Like we have the springboard of knowing how Eindhoven's triangle is set up. Now we're really just adding six electrodes around the chest we're assuming, yeah, okay, if I understand how vectors and electrodes work, we're getting all these different slices through the heart. Setup is easy. Understanding it is something else. This is what you'll get printed out. This is the, uh, the ECG trace for a 12-lead ECG. And you can see all of the electrodes or all of the leads that we've just talked about. You have your lead, and it's all always in the same order, I should say. Always in the same order. Lead one, lead two, lead three on the left. Lead two is what you would be most familiar with. P wave, QRS, T wave. Complementary to those, we have AVR, AVL, AVF, the augmented voltage leads. They, some of them look somewhat similar. Some of them are pretty different. They tell you different information because they're in a slightly different plane. And then all the chest leads are on the right-hand side. V1, V2, V3, 4, 5, 6. And you can kind of imagine, even just not knowing what you're looking at, you can see how the signal changes. As you progress through in order, you can see how the signal changes as you look through a slightly different slice, a slightly different area of the heart. So we're going to spend a lot of time looking at this example trace and other example traces to figure out what this is telling us. If I asked you what this is telling us right now, you probably wouldn't be able to come up with many answers other than maybe heart rate. But we have information on rate, rhythm, the axis of the heart, hypertrophy if the heart is enlarged, uh, infarction, if there's been damage or cell death within the tissue of the heart, we can tell that from this trace. And we're going to start looking at that right now. This is technically next week's material. We have a ton of time, though, and this was an abbreviated introductory section. This section's longer. There's a lot of detail, so I'm going to get into it a little bit with some introductory concepts. And these slides are on Moodle. I just realized this morning that they weren't, so I uploaded them hastily. You will find them there if you're using your computer and looking. If you plan to print them out, I'm really sorry. But you can follow along. So interpreting 
a 12 lead ECG trace. This is the same slide that I just put up at the end of the last section. Right now, kind of arbitrary, there's a lot of unknowns, but we are going through each of these five elements and by the end, you'll be able to take a 12 lead ECG trace that you might find on a midterm exam and go through and decipher what it is about that 12 lead ECG trace that's unique or special or at least describe each of these factors from an unlabeled trace. We're going to start off easy. Right, it's easy. This was generated on a, on a 12 lead ECG machine that didn't automatically calculate rate or from a person that wasn't wearing a heart rate monitor. So we need to figure out how to discern the rate, the heartbeat, the heart rhythm of this individual. Now every single 12 lead ECG trace, whether it's a printout or on physical paper, will give you the electrodes in the same order and be drawn on a special kind of paper. You can see the paper in the background. It's this grid system. There are larger discernible boxes. Each of those is broken up into a five by five square of smaller boxes. And you'll also see on the left hand side, there's this um, calibrating marker to show you what, I think it's a millivolt, what one millivolt represents on this trace. There's this flat uh, precipice or cliff that tells you this is the magnitude of the signal. So those are standard or constant. You can uh, memorize if you want to that one large box is 200 milliseconds. And if there are five small boxes within a large box, that means that each small box is 40 milliseconds. So even just telling you that information, you have everything you need to calculate rate. And you can do it really precisely. Let's try calculating rate. I'm going to calculate rate on this trace, and I'm going to pick an area where I have really well-defined markers. And I always use the QRS complexes because they point to the squares or the boxes, the lines, where you should start and end. So I'm going to use these, uh, these two, this pair of QRS complexes, to calculate rate in this example. So what I might do is find two QRS complexes that fall on um, lines within the graph paper. I'm going to go through and calculate, well, this one has six large boxes and two small boxes. And you can probably calculate that from your seats. There are one, two, three, four, five, six big divisions. I have one small box on the left-hand side and one small sliver on the right-hand side. Six large and two small boxes. So knowing that each large box is 200 milliseconds, one small box is 40 milliseconds, overall this is 1,280 milliseconds. Or, if you want to work in seconds, 1.28 seconds, to complete two beats. Okay, that's not how I'm used to understanding rate. I usually think of rate as beats per minute. Uh, seconds for two beats is not something that's easily transferable, so let's convert. Pretty simple math in this case. If you have two beats, in 1.28 seconds, how many beats are in one minute? What's really confusing about this example is the seconds. That's the one thing that I can't wrap my head around. Beats per second is not what I want to convey or relate to um, a patient or my friend or my family member. Beats per second is not really useful. So, how many seconds are in one minute? 60 seconds are in one minute, and I simply multiply and uh, divide. 2 times 60 is 120, divided by 1.28 gives me 93.75 beats per minute. Let's call it 94 beats per minute. Now, some people freeze when they see math, like correction factors, equations, I hate this. 
one way that I, an alternative way to get this that I, I'd like to, to reason out or to, to narrate is instead of using a correction, a correction factor to go from seconds to minutes, you can read the problem as such. If I have two beats in 1.28 seconds, how many beats are in 60 seconds? So that's one way that I like to narrate the problem. So I'm defining that I want the number of beats in 60 seconds. I have that notion that that's a minute already. I don't need to worry about correction factors. If two beats happen in 1.28 seconds, how many beats happen in 60 seconds? So saying that out allows you to set up the equation um, as such, and then it's just cross multiplication and solve for x, which I hope you remember from grade 9 or grade 10 algebra. Solve for x gives you 93.75 beats per minute as well. But that's long. With all this calculator, you can't really do that by, by hand in your head. It's not quick. If we take these rules, we can create a system that is a bit more user friendly. One large box is 200 milliseconds. One small box is 40 milliseconds. In this example, I have every beat falling about three large boxes away. Well, let's work up to that. If I had one QRS complex landing on every single major division line. I'd have one beat every 200 milliseconds. If I work that out, one beat in 0.2 seconds times my correction factor, or word it out the, uh, the way I show you, showed you on the last slide. If a QRS complex fell on every major division line, that person would exhibit a rate of 300 beats per minute. Now, of course, you're never going to see that. It's not physiological. But we're building a framework. If a QRS complex landed on every single major division line, that would be 300 beats per minute. Well, what about every second major division line? If one beat happened every 0.4 seconds, that would give me a rate of 150 beats per minute. Okay. So since QRS complexes are easily distinguishable, since I can tell if they're landing on those major division lines or not, what I can do is follow this through logically, figure out uh, what the rate would be every third major division, every fourth major division, every fifth. And if that were an easy-ish sequence to memorize, I could ballpark heart rate just by looking at where those QRS complexes fell. And so you don't have to go through and calculate them. I did it for you on the next slide. If one QRS complex lands every major division, 300 beats per minute. Every second major division, 150 beats per minute. Every third is 100, every fourth is 75, every fifth is 60, every sixth is 50. And really, this will contain most reasonable, most uh, expected heart rates, either at rest or during exercise, arrhythmias, um, any clinical patients should be found within this rule. We call this the 300 rule. And it is really just to your benefit to memorize the order. 300, 150, 175, 60, 50. So you, you, uh, to use this rule, you would find one QRS complex that lands perfectly on one major division, and then you count. How far is the next one? 300, 150, 175, 60, 50. Notice that's a lot quicker and counting the boxes, using your calculator, and doing a correction factor. So let's look at this example. This QRS complex lands perfectly on a major grid line. 
Now I can count 300, 150, 175, and I'm already done. Now, it's somewhere between 100 and 75. If I look at where it falls between those two, it's not halfway. So it's not 83, what is that, 83.5 is halfway? It's not 83, it's closer towards 100, so I'm looking in the 90, 91, 92 range, low 90s. This is the same example as on the last slide. We calculated this as 93.75. Halfway between would be 87, I was off. Low 90s um, heart rate because it's pushing up towards the, the third marker. 300, 150, 100, 75, 60, 50. And so given any 12 lead ECG trace, any lead two ECG trace, any unlabeled ECG trace, you can now figure out heart rate in a matter of seconds. I would ask you to, to practice that, but you get a sense of what the heart rate is here at the bottom because it's listed on this image. Actually, let's try that anyways. Let's try that anyways. Maybe I'll, I'll lead you through this one quickly. Let's see if this, this uh, text box was correct. So what I want to do is find a QRS complex that lies exactly on, or as close to as possible, a major grid line. I'm looking at this one, the fifth one. 300, 150, 100, 75, 60. So between 75 and 60, it's closer to 60. There's 15 beats per minute between those two, uh, those two major grid lines. It's about a third of the way. So yeah, 70 sounds about right. What I'm showing you on this slide is an even easier way to ballpark heart rate, but this one has some inherent flaws. This is the six second rule, which is like what you would do if you were taking heart rate manually in lab. You'd count the number of beats for six seconds multiplied by 10. Some of the graph paper that you're going to get will have these marks at the top. See these little tick marks in the middle of nowhere? Some of them don't, but some of them will show you this tick mark above the grid each one of those tick marks represents three seconds. So, six second rule would be um, find three of them, count the number of beats between those three, from zero seconds to three to six seconds. I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven beats, multiply by 10, about 70 beats per minute. The The problem is that not all of these have the uh, tick marks up top. If you don't have the tick marks, you can still do the six second rule, but you've got to find out uh, where 30 boxes starts and ends. 30 boxes is also six seconds. If you were to ballpark this with the 300 rule, you'd get about 70 as well. If you were to calculate this using the, the, uh, the boxes themselves or ruler, you get 65.2, four large boxes and three small. So the other two approximations are a little bit off. A ruler is most accurate, but it takes a calculator and a bit of time. If you're looking at someone that has a 65 beat per minute heart rate and you tell them it's 70, not really a big deal. Close enough. The reason why I don't like the six second rule it's easy to multiply by 10, but you're not only counting and extrapolating the number of beats. You're counting and extrapolating the error. So at the start, there's this time before a beat even lands. This is a fraction of a beat. That's error included in your measurement. You're doing 10 times this error when you do your final calculation. There's also error here. This last QRS complex doesn't land right at the, um, the three second mark. So you not only extrapolate the number of beats, I have one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I'm feeling like this is wrong for more reasons than what I'm telling you as well. I'll come back to that. Anyways, you're not only counting the number of beats, you're counting the error. You can ballpark it pretty well. 
but it's not as accurate as measuring it by hand. It's also difficult because on a 12-lead ECG trace, you don't have that much time. Each trace is compressed. It's not giving you six seconds to use the six-second rule. And so you'd rather use the 300 rule or measure it out by hand. So who wants to be brave and ballpark heart rate on this example? Using any rule of your choosing, any method of your choosing. So point me in the right direction. I'll be your band of light. Okay. Um, two. Lead two. First one? Okay. So you're looking above or below? Above? Okay. So I'm looking at looking at this first one. That pretty much falls right on a major grid line. Awesome. Okay. How do you want to calculate? I'm going to use the 300 rule. 300 rule. Okay, so count for me. It's 1, 2, 3. 4, 300. 300, 150, 200. 100, okay. Now, okay, so we got 100. This is a little bit past 100. So if you were to ballpark the heart rate, what would you say it's close to or in the vicinity of? Um, you circumvented a very common problem that a lot of people have when we first start reading these, in that when I'm counting 300, 150, 100, this is a bit past 100. Part of me wants to say it's maybe 105, 110. You're correct. I'm wrong. The next one's 75, so this goes down as you get further out. I'm, I'm letting you know that a common problem is that you might want to say 100, this is a bit above 100. That's wrong. You keep going down. You've got that in, in your pocket. No problem. You've got the right approach. So about 90, 95. <laughs> Good. If I calculate it out exactly, 90.9. Six large and three small for two beats. All right. We're in the vicinity. What about this one? Okay. Sometimes the information is in the printout on the bottom. This just tells you how quickly it was moving. So it doesn't tell you what heart rate is. Who wants to try this one? Usually the person that volunteers, someone else, ends up self-volunteering. OK. Um, and you start from the second line down. OK, second line down. So what? Uh, what lead am I looking at? You're looking at lead is it two? Sure, yeah. So well, always in the same order. One, two, three, ABR, ABL, ABF. You've got a bit more information on this one. You can pick one trace and follow it the entire time. So you might be able to figure out with um, the pick boxes if they had them, do the six second rule. But I like your approach. Let's follow lead two. So what's the difference between uh, the last So our, our 12 lead ECG that we're used to are these top three lines. Yeah. We have all 12 leads shown here. The bottom line is just lead one for the entire time. So this shows you okay. a, longer, uh, a longer picture, a longer window than these, which repeat over and over within their small squares. So this is a, a longer window to work with. OK, let's take the first two. Yeah. OK, so you start, you start at lead, I think it's the second. Okay. So then would you start with the rule and you go 300, 150, 180, 75, and then if there's 60, then it's like 2, 75, and 60. Okay. So plus the 75. Yep. So it's like 80 over 70. Love it. That's perfect. I would say about 70. It's actually 68. Four large and two small boxes. So by the numbers, you're not accurate but you are 
pretty accurate. You can ballpark them within a fraction of a second, whereas counting the boxes out and doing the correction factor takes some time and you need a calculator to do that. So 300 rule, dead easy. You can do this in a few seconds. 300, 150, 100, 75, 60, 50. Just memorize that, uh, that sequence and you can figure out rate in any tracer shown. Uh, if we summarize briefly, the most accurate way, of course, is using the boxes or a ruler to figure out what space is between a certain number of beats. That's by far the most accurate, but it's the slowest. Requires a calculator, can't be done in your head. I would choose the 300 rule as the next most accurate. It's pretty good, and it's fast if you know the sequence. You find one QRS complex on the line, you count out the next major divisions, easy peasy, you've got your ballpark. If you get really comfortable with this and you're given a trace where no QRS complex falls on the line, what would you do? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So let's say that your QRS complex falls just before the line. Instead of counting line to line to line, I would count just before the line to just before the line to just before to just before to just before. Still 300, 150, 175, 60, 50. But it might be slightly askew. It doesn't happen that often. You should always be able to find one that falls on the line. I haven't seen a trace yet where there, there hasn't been that, um, that option. Six second rule, really quick, multiply by 10, add a zero, but is not typically as reliable as the other rules because you also magnify the error as well in your calculation. Generally, uh, clinicians use the 300 rule to ballpark their heart rate. I'm, if you'll indulge me, I'm kind of like working on a theory in the back of my mind for why the six second rule is also not good. So I'm going to go back here for a second. Six second rule wants you to count the number of beats, right? Or count the number of cycles. We went one, two, three, four, five, six, seven times 10, 70 beats per minute. When this QRS complex fires has a cycle completed. Well, part of it's completed, but really, cardiac cycle completes when you move from one QRS to the other. So this should be one cardiac cycle, two, three, four, five, six. You've got six complete cardiac cycles within those six seconds. So I would even revise this and say this is ballparking maybe 60, possibly 65, given that we start a bit into the range of beats per minute. Even less accurate. But I don't know if that holds up. I'm going to go and work on that in my spare time. So rate is done. 300 rule, you can leave the rest behind. You don't need to worry about calculators or rulers or boxes. The 300 rule will um, serve you well in any situation where you might be asked about heart rate. Uh, sorry, heart rate. Rhythm is the next item that we're looking at. Of course, nowadays you don't even need to look on an ECG trace. You've got your watch or your phone or whatever device you, uh, you're currently wearing to help you figure that out. Rate was easy. Rhythm is not. I'm going to introduce rhythm and then we'll just call it a little bit early today. Rhythm is probably one of the trickier, uh, the trickier elements to figure out because you have a bit of creative license. You have to do some sleuthing and investigating to really understand how rhythm is different or if it is different. And so what I mean by rhythm is regularity. Rhythm should be regular. The features of your trace should always appear in the same order and generally be spaced out uh, by a similar amount of space. If you are 
at steady state. If you're at rest, if you're during exercise, as long as you're not transitioning or someone doesn't scare you halfway through the measurement, it should be pretty stable. If there's ever a situation where there is unequal spacing, so features compress together and then expand out, or some things are missing from the cardiac cycle, that would indicate an abnormal rhythm or an arrhythmia. Now the trace I'm showing you here is a normal trace. It looks normal, although I'm, I'm questioning why I would put a normal trace up in the rhythm section. Maybe it's to lead you in um, before getting into the complicated examples. But you can see equidistant QRS complexes in all traces. They're spaced apart by a similar amount. You can see the features are all the same within each depolarization. For each lead, each of these depolarizations looks the same. The magnitude might be slightly different, but in general, very similar order and appearance of the features in the trace. This depicts regular rhythm. And so when you don't observe this, you're looking for abnormal rhythm or arrhythmia. Now, more often than not, normal rhythm is dictated by the SA node. SA node, the sinoatrial node, at the very base or top of the heart, right where the uh, superior vena cava and the aorta um, are found, right at, the, uh, at the, the right atrium, the tip of the right atrium, as blood pours in. And the SA node is one of those spontaneously depolarizing cells. It's a pacemaker cell. And it is fast. It depolarizes many times, 60 to 100 times per minute once every second or more. So the SA node is quick. And if everything is working normally, the SA node should fire regularly. And it should connect to all of the other parts of the heart through the electrical conduction system. And we haven't reviewed that exactly yet, but we will um, discuss different parts of it as we go through the section. Because when things go wrong and arrhythmias occur, it's because parts of the electrical conduction system are detached or delayed, or there are many inputs to that same conduction system. But under normal situations, the SA node fires frequently. It sends signals down the uh, electrical conduction system, and it triggers depolarization throughout the heart. And what you'll notice is I've listed a few other areas in the heart. These areas also have spontaneous depolarizing characteristics. They would also be pacemakers, but they're slower. They're slower than the SA node. And so what happens when the signal from the SA node arrives before these are ready to depolarize on their own? Well, they depolarize. They receive a signal from upstream it triggers depolarization. Because we have that refractory period, it resets the clock. So the SA node working quickly will trigger all of these in order before they can trigger by themselves. And this is, this is central to the idea of normal rhythm. The SA node firing consistently and delivering that signal to the other foci within the heart which is plural for focus, which wasn't really intuitive when I first made up these slides. I thought it was focuses, but it's foci. Locations or foci within the heart. The SA node is kind of the master pacemaker that overrides uh, other uh, points in the atria. Uh, the, the AV node in the junction between the atria and the ventricles, and then some cells in the ventricles themselves, in the, in the muscle fiber tissue of the ventricles, that want to depolarize. The SA node overrides them all. So this is a normal situation. If this is disrupted, and this will be my last slide for today, if this is disrupted, if the signal doesn't move through seamlessly, if it's not propagated to all areas of the conduction system, 
if there's some blockage, we can interpret that as some degree of heart block. If normal electrical conduction is interrupted, if it's obstructed, if it's delayed, it's a form of heart block. So an arrhythmia will be a symptom of heart block. Heart block is general and vague. The truth is that the obstruction, the interruption, the delay can occur at any number of places along that conduction pathway or in the conduction system of the heart. And where that delay occurs, the location, and the magnitude of the block, it dictates the severity, and we can classify or categorize different um, ECG traces into mild, moderate, and severe blocks. We can even classify them into where the block occurs, in the atria, between the atria and the ventricles, or in the ventricle. So the location and the magnitude dictates the severity. Some heart blocks are, are really just delays that make for skipped beats, which is the SA node doesn't override the AV node or other foci. They manage to depolarize, and you get this jump, this little flutter of your heart that eventually resets. It's a skipped beat. So when we come back next week, we're going to look in detail at varying degrees of heart block. Heart block can occur if the SA node is deficient. It can occur if the AV node is deficient, linking the atria and the ventricles. Or there can be an infrahissian block, which is beneath the bundle of hiss, which was a, uh, a characteristic of the conduction system of the bundle branches within the ventricles. If there's a block in the ventricles, we generally categorize it as an infrahissian block. In a young, healthy person, if we ever exhibit an anomaly, it's usually transient. It corrects itself. For a person that develops a chronic condition over time, depending on the severity of the block, they might be able to live with it. But usually, the block will become more severe over time. And if it becomes too severe, we'll need to install an artificial pacemaker that takes over the role of dictator in the heart. So these are the locations at the SA node, the AV node, or within the ventricles. And then at each one, we can categorize different degrees of severity. First degree, second degree, third degree block. These are increasing severity. We most commonly see all three flavors or varieties at the AV node, but there are different degrees of severity in each location. So we'll look at the most common ones when we come back next week. We'll explore all three levels, all three degrees to understand um, how we might interpret it on a 12-lead ECG trace. So we can get some pretty good information to understand how the signal might be disorganized and what that means as far as function. Question? Yeah. Um A skip beat could be exactly that. So the SA node didn't override the other foci, and they triggered first. Technically, that's a, a premature ventricular contraction, or PVC. You see that a lot in athletes, where their heart feels like it skips and jumps ahead. Um, a more correct definition for a skipped beat is if the signal somehow doesn't pass through. For whatever reason, the signal doesn't pass through you get the SA node depolarizing, and then nothing happens. But often, that will reset, and then when the SA node triggers again, the signal's carried through. Depending on where the blockage is and what caused it, um, skip beats are self-correcting and infrequent.